what a year it's been. Uh, 2020 uh, sent a lot of churches into a tailspin, uh, not really sure how to uh, worship, how to move forward, how to navigate through uh, the, the virus and the pandemic. And uh, if you uh, have been here since March, you've, you've seen how we've navigated through the difficulties and uh, with our online uh, services and uh, the recording of the services and then playing them on Sunday morning. Uh, and it's good to be able to get back into our church building and uh, to worship and honor the Lord uh, in, a, in person. Uh, but it has been a very difficult year, and I pray that this year, 2021, uh, will be just as exciting. Uh, you never know what the Lord is going to do this year. Uh, we, we go into a new year with anticipation, uh, wondering how the Lord is going to work in our lives, how the Lord's going to work in our church services, and how the Lord's going to use Grace Baptist Church. Uh, as many of the things that we had planned for 2020 uh, were kind of pushed to the wayside and uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, our team camp, our vacation Bible school, our Kids for Christ camp, our missions conference, our revival, all those things were postponed or canceled, and uh, I am anticipating a wonderful 2021. Uh, last week in our staff meeting, I had made mention to Scott that, and, and Amber both that 2020, to, to me, was a little discouraging, uh, simply because I was not able to go out as much into the hospitals when people are sick or into the nursing homes and visit. Uh, into people's homes uh, simply because uh, I do not want to be one who is maybe asymptomatic and go into a house and, and spread it. So it's, it's been very difficult and a little bit discouraging. And I shared that with Scott, and Scott said, I'm just the opposite. Now, Scott is the eternal optimist, I guess, and I'm just a pessimist. I don't know. Uh, but he was encouraged by it all, just the way uh, we sometimes get set in a rut in church, and we do it week by week, the same way, every day, same thing over and over. Well, this caused us to think outside the box and to do some things and our reflections from grace that we did on a weekly basis and, and things like that to try to get the Word of God out to you. And uh, I, I just hope that uh, this year, is. I pray that this year, uh, 2021, is better uh, for us as a church, that we will not be able to have to cancel as many things, but that's why I am uh, anticipating a, a revival in February. Dr. Getch was here back in 2018, uh, had a wonderful uh, Sunday through Wednesday services with him, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. So I hope that you are as too, and just pray that uh, we be able to go ahead and move forward with that. Over the past uh, four weeks or so, we have celebrated Thanksgiving. We have celebrated the birth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have <clears throat> celebrated the new year. And uh, this part of the, of the season, the year, is always uh, enjoyable for me because I, I like Thanksgiving because of the turkey, <clears throat> because of the ham, because of the uh, desserts, because of the, the corn, because of the potatoes. I, I enjoy all those things and, and the other uh, uh, supplements that we had during those times. Uh, I remember on Thanksgiving Day, we getting done and uh, from the dinner table and just kind of pushing myself away from the table and going to sit into my recliner and, and, and just think to myself, boy, I am full. Uh, and I acted full because as soon as my feet went up, the chair went back and I was asleep. And that's generally what happens. And when you get a full stomach, you, you just sit in the chair, you put your feet up, and pretty soon you are sawing a log of Z's. I mean, you're just cutting, you're just, it's just tiring. Well, then Christmas came, and the same thing happened. We had a nice meal. We had all the other sides of desserts and all those things and pushed ourselves away from the table and got in that chair again. And boy, I said to myself, boy, am I full. Now, I didn't feel like eating any more the rest of the day. I almost felt like a glutton. I guess borderline gluttony took place that day. Well, I was full. I was tired. I went, sat down, and put the feet up, and a few minutes later, Z's. Well, New Year's Day came. Had a nice meal, had the desserts, pushed myself away from the dinner table, 
boy, am I full. Went, sat down on the chair, put the feet up. I was able to stay up a little bit longer because we had guests in the house. I didn't want to start snoring with guests in the house. But each day, each celebration, I came off with this, this feeling of just being so full of all this food and all these different things. And I thought to myself, I am full physically, but am I full spiritually? Am I full spiritually? I'd like to preach a message this morning, being a spirit-filled Christian. And I think this is fitting as we begin 2021. It's important that we start the year out on the, on the right foot and we, we get a good uh, firm foundation, a good basis spiritually. And I believe that in order to have that, that basis, in order to have that, that, that understanding of, of the beginning of the year is that we need to re remember that we as believers need to be, we must be spirit-filled individuals. Now, I'm not saying you push yourself away from church. You go sit in your chair, put your feet up, and say, boy, am I full. I'm talking about being spirit-filled, spirit-controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. We know we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the, the third person in the Trinity. And folks, there are several different examples in the Scriptures of individuals being filled with the Spirit. In Acts chapter 15, verse 32, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. The apostle Paul, shortly after he was saved, Ananias came to him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, of the church is to be filled with the Spirit. The church is to be filled with the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake, the word of God will with boldness. Can I proclaim to you this morning that one of the essentials of a Christian is to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? A lot of times we are filled with ourselves. We're, we're filled with self and what, what we want rather than being filled with the Holy Spirit of God and listening to the, the small, still voice of God to determine how and how and what and what we're supposed to do in our lives. We need to be filled. We need to be controlled. And contrary to what many people may think, many people may think, well, it, it's not really as important for a church member to be filled and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. It's up to the pastor to be filled and controlled. It, it's up to the, to, to, to the staff to be filled and controlled with the Holy Spirit of God. It's up to the, the church board, the, the men who, who make the decisions, the financial decisions, the, the spiritual decisions, the, the spiritual counsel for their pastor. It's up to them to be spirit-filled with the Spirit of God. It's not true. We should, the pastor, the staff, the, the deacon board, but each and every member here at Grace Baptist Church, every child of God that's not a member of Grace Baptist Church, if they've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, they've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, they ought to be living and filled and controlled with the Holy Spirit of God. Do you know what the Holy Spirit of God does? He reproves. When you're going down or making a wrong decision or, or maybe you're, you're, you're in sin, the Holy Spirit of God, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, when you're controlled with the Holy Spirit of God, what he's going to do is he's going to bring you back in line. He's going to bring conviction to your heart about what you're doing that is contrary to the commands of Scripture, and he's going to bring you back into line so that you can have a, an effective Christian life. And you realize in Ephesians chapter number 5, it says, Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a suggestion. 
It's, it's not a, a, a recommendation. Hey, you know what? I recommend to you that you do your best to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or, or a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's a command. It is a command of God. Just as the Ten Commandments are commands, so is this where it says, Be ye filled. It's the same terminology, the same meaning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it talks about the Lord's Supper. Where the Apostle Paul writes, This do in remembrance of me. Realize that partaking of the Lord's Supper is a command. A command for Christians to to observe the Lord's Supper until he comes again out of remembrance of him. It's not a suggestion. It's not a A number one, A plus recommendation. It's a command. That we as believers be filled with the Holy Ghost. One man said this, if we're not living spirit-filled lives, we're actually living in disobedience. And disobedience is not living by faith where it says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So how can we be spirit-filled? How can we be spirit-filled individuals this morning? How can we be spirit-filled individuals with the Holy Spirit of God in our lives and controlled and, and continual controlling throughout 2021? Well, I hope to be able to share some truths with you this morning of how we can be spirit-filled. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would watch over us, Lord, that you would as we already have spoken, you and I together, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit. That, Father, that, you would not, uh, that I would not say the things that I want to say, but, Lord, the things that you want to be heard by your people today. Father, I pray that you would work in the hearts of each one that is listening this morning. Just as the pastor needs to be spirit-filled, the, the, the members need to be spirit-filled as they listen. So, Father, I pray that you would fill each one with your Holy Spirit today. And that we would understand how important it is that we have a Spirit-filled life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I have a couple of different references uh, that we're going to be looking at today. I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. As we look at our first point, the residence of the Holy Spirit of God. The, the residence of the Holy Spirit in us. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Now remember, uh, the Corinthian church is a very carnal church. Uh, it, it's a type of church that you really did not want to be a member of. There is sin that was rampant through the, the, the Corinthian church. And, and here the Apostle Paul starts off in, in just the third chapter. And he says in verse number 16, he says to these believers, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, we're not going to uh, advance and go through the rest of the book of Corinthians. You can do that on your own time today if you'd like. I'd encourage you to see what type of lives this Corinthian church was living. But the Apostle Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. What he's referring to is that every born-again believer, now there's in the days of the first century church or today, a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ at the time of your salvation experience. The time in which you had understood that it was not by what you could do to merit eternal life. It's by what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. When you first realize that you're a sinner, that you need a salvation, a, a payment for your sin, and then that you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as payment for your sin, 
and then you believe upon him, once that transaction has occurred in your life, what happens then is that the Holy Spirit of God indwells the believer. The Holy Spirit of God indwells the believer, and now we have someone living inside of us, the Holy Spirit. Not just a spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and spoke of the Holy Ghost which dwelleth inside of us, dwelleth in us. That word dwell literally means to have someone occupy a house. Now, I dwell at 167 North Oler Avenue in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. That is my house. That is where I live. That is where I dwell. That is where I go to get away from all the world's activities. I go to dwell at 167 North Oler. You have a dwelling place that you live at as well. A place that you dwell, that you take up residence in. Right? Do we? Anybody have a house, an apartment, a home, a trailer, a, a, a cabin, a, a tent, uh, anything? You, you dwell inside. I have some neighbors here. They live down the street from me. The Mons, they are neighbors, and they dwell over on North Oler as well. That's their residence. That's where they, they, they abide. And the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy, and he's telling us here in, in the book of Corinthians, that the body of a Christian is the house occupied by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit resides in all who are genuinely saved. Know ye not, Grace Baptist Church? Know ye not, Grace Baptist Church, that ye are a temple of God this morning? You are a, a temple. You are a, a tabernacle. You are the, the, the outside dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. He lives inside of you today. And, you know, we realize this, that by, by believing what the Bible tells us, there's not any type of a manifestation of the Holy Spirit inside of us where we're going to start running down the aisles and barking like dogs because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not going to go standing up on the pews and jumping up and, and speaking in a foreign tongue because that, 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 that is a sign gift and that is over. That's no longer. A manifestation, I guess we can say, of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives is us living according to God's Word. Living according to the Scriptures. And Paul here was asking in Corinthians, asking for the Corinthian believers to realize that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, had taken up residence in their bodies. And the Apostle Paul, he asked two questions. He asked, number one, what are you? Paul asked, know ye not that ye are the temple of God? It's interesting how the Apostle Paul uses this, this imagery uh, used in the Old Testament of the temple. The temple had been built for the glory of God. And then bore the name of God. So the temple of God was, was erected for the glory of God. And God, you entered into the temple. And God, it was a manifestation of, Christ, of God there within the temple. Now, there were pagan temples. There were temples to Aphrodite. There were other uh, pagan temples that were in different areas in Corinth. But here we're talking about not the temples of pagan gods. A, a, a temple of, of, of the Lord God of Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 8, it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. He, he, he desired to build that house. He didn't get to build that house, but he desired to build the house of God. And that house of God, it bared the name of God. And I think about this, this thought here, this principle, that the temple of God was to be used to glorify God, to bring glory unto him. Now, we take that to 2021 today. 
We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are the temple of God this morning. How are we going to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, to Jehovah, to God, this year through our temples, through our lives? It is a decision that each and every one of us is going to have to decide and choose soon of how you are going to allow the Holy Spirit of God to use your body, your temple, your tabernacle to show glory and honor to him. you got to come to that decision, folks. Hey, you know what? I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to love God. I'm going to obey God. And as people see you obeying and honoring and respecting and loving, people are going to see that there's a difference in your life because you have a purpose of glory and to show glory and honor unto our Heavenly Father. What are you? Realize you are a temple. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. In the Old Testament, the temple was a separated building. It was separated from all the other buildings. It was apart from itself. It was separated from all the other ones. You think about that principle. How we as believers are to be separated from the world. We're supposed to be consecrated, separated, different, apart from the world's philosophies, from the world's directions, from the world's ways. We're supposed to be separated from them. Consecrated. But not just what you are, you're a temple. But who is in you, it says that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. I'm not going to go along on this, because I think I've already hit that nail on the head as far as what, who we are and who we have. We have God. God lives in me through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not symbolic, but it's a reality. It's not a symbolism or symbolic. It's a reality. It's a fact. And every place and everything that we do, you realize that? We bring God with us. Boy, I wish I could... I wish I can take back some of the places that I have gone to or or some of the things that I had said or some of the things that I had thought knowing that God is dwelling inside of me. He lives through us, through the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a temporary residence, is it? It's just not for a few weeks or for a few, a, a few months or a couple of years. The Holy Spirit indwells us forever in John chapter 14, 16. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. He's not going to disappear. He's not going to leave you He will always be right there with us. He resides in us. He is always with us, and he is always in us. Hallelujah for that thought, for that truth. But secondly, the resources of the Holy Spirit for us. The resources that we have, the Holy Spirit, the resource that we have. I have a a, a computer in my office that has a Bible software program called Logos. And this Logos computer program, I am able to click on a, a link or click on a resource, and it will tell me, it'll, it'll take me to a, a, a screen where I just enter the passage. So if I put in there Romans chapter 1, verse 1, 
it'll, it'll pop up there and it'll show me what the Greek words are, the Greek word meanings, uh, the tenses, and all these different things. Well, another click, you click on the library, and all of a sudden you have uh, different uh, theologians and authors and writers, and there's a bunch of different resources on this side here. I can click on that one there, and it'll tell me what uh, Spurgeon thinks about this passage of Scripture. I'll click on another, and it'll say this is what Ryrie uh, says in, in his commentary. And I have these resources at the tip of my finger. I can just click it, and it helps me to understand the Scriptures. It, it, it helps me as I exegete the Scriptures. But the resources of the Holy Spirit is what we have available to us, a resource and a major resource, the best resource of all, to live a life that is separated and consecrated. One man said this, unless we have within us that which is above us, we shall soon yield to the pressures around us. You get that? I'll say it one more time. Unless we have within us that which is above us, we shall soon yield to the pressures around us. If we're not controlled, the pressures of the world is going to infiltrate our lives and it's going to destroy us. And some may think, well, that, that would never happen to me. That couldn't happen to me. It will. When we let our guard down, our, 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 I guess our protective fence, the Holy Spirit of God, and we quench the Holy Spirit of God, and, and, and that, that protective resource that we have goes down. We are open for anything and everything. One of the greatest lessons that we can learn as a Christian is that we cannot in ourselves meet the demands that God has placed upon us. And we allow the Holy Spirit to help us and work through us. I read this, if I was to be all God wanted me to be, and to do all God wanted me to do, I had to have some help. Can't do it on our own. That comforter, the Holy Spirit, we talked about in John chapter 14. That comforter, that, that, that helper is to come and to help us live our lives in a pleasing way for the Lord Jesus Christ. But how, in which way do we have these resources? Now turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And verse number 19. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things unto God. And the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another. I see in the first part here, as far as the resources that we have, we have the resource of the Holy Spirit of God to assist us and to help us in our worship life. In our life of, of worship, a spirit-filled life will be a worshiping life, one that will worship the Lord. I wrote this down. Why are so many, why is it that so many do not worship when they come to church? The example is very simple. Because we're not filled and controlled and have that will to worship him. You realize, folks, that worship of the Lord Jesus Christ is not just coming here and sitting down in a pew at Grace Baptist Church. That is not worship. That would be what I would call attendance. Worship is in the heart. Worship is how you are worshiping and, and reflecting and reverencing the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. Our worship is not just coming to church. Anybody can come to church. Worship is a heart issue. 
desiring to honor and exalt the Lord Jesus and, and getting things right in your own lives, in your own hearts, in your own homes, so that your life could be used of God. God desires our church to be a clean vessel. God desires that our homes be clean and abstain in absence of sin. God desires our hearts to be, be free from sin. But oftentimes what we do is we think that just worship is coming here and singing a few stanzas, listening to the preacher preach for a 35-minute sermon and going home, oh yeah, worship the Lord. In the Old Testament, worship was not just a, a, an hour and a half long. They, they sang hymns unto the Lord for, for, for uh, an hours. They, they, they opened up the scrolls of scriptures. They, they listened. They, they responded. Do you realize that? That part of worship is responding to what you hear? And I'm not saying everyone needs to come forward in front of the church and, and respond that way, but a response from where you're at, a true, genuine response to what the Holy Spirit does in your lives. Worship is not this, the excitement of the flesh. Worship is not the excitement of the flesh. And much of the, uh, the, the newer churches that are coming out here uh, nowadays are, are, are a movement of uh, entertaining the flesh rather than a biblical structure of worship. Justin Martyr, an early church Christian, gave us this picture of a service during the early days. He wrote this. On Sundays, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place. The memoirs of the apostle or the books of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ended, the pastor in a discourse instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these glorious examples. Then we all rise together and send upwards our prayers. And when we have ceased from praying, from the bread and the wine and the water are brought, the pastor offers, offers a prayer of thanksgiving and the congregation assents with an amen. It was obvious spirit of worship was in the early church. And I'm afraid in our 21st century, in the time which we're living, is that we've missed the mark. We've missed it. A spirit-filled life is a life that is spirit-filled for worship. But it's also, number two, a, our wedded wife. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. One man said this, You may not ever hear this in a marriage ceremony, in seminars, but this. But a husband and a wife will never be the spouses of God, that God wants them to be until they are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Husbands and wives need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Realizing the imperfections that spouses have, I have a ton of imperfections. You can talk to Lisa after church today and she will say, yes, he does. And you can come to me and say, hey, hey, does Lisa have any imperfections in her life? And I would say, no. <laughs> I was born at night, but not last night. I guess that's how they say it. <laughs> but a spirit-filled home, a spirit-filled couple, a spirit-filled husband and wife, spouses, Will be, it will be used of God and it will be a much happier wedded life when they're both controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. But in Ephesians chapter number 5, look at Ephesians chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 not just in our worship life or our wedded life, but also our work life. Look what it says in verse number five. 
It says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, with singleness of heart of your heart. As unto Christ, not with eye servants, as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. The Holy Spirit of God is going to convict us about our work ethic. It's going to convict us of, 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 of the life of a Christian. We ought to be the best workers in, in, in Waynesboro. We ought to have the best testimony amongst, every, amongst our workers, co-workers. Because we're filled with the Spirit, we're not going to run off the rail if someone uh, says something bad to us. We're not going to react when we're Spirit-filled. Filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Of course, Paul here is, was talking about the employment and the employer. I wrote this down. Christians should be the most respected honest, hard workers that an employer has. We ought to be. We ought to be the best workers. But also look at verses 10 and 11. Not just our worship life or our wedded life or our work life, but also our warring life. Look what it says in verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand, withstand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, the Christian life is not a playground. It's not. It's not a, a playground. It's a battlefield, folks. There's a battle going on. And Satan, the devil, is winning these battles. Winning these, these incursions, winning these, these times of battle together with us. But when we are filled, thinking about, you know, we, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God but, and fall into sin. But if we, we are, keep our minds fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, and God Almighty, remember who's, who we are and who we belong to, and, and constantly thinking about that in every decision that we make, it would change a lot of our decisions, I believe. If we realize the decisions that we're making, we pray about it, we think about, is this going to hurt anybody? Is this going to hurt the Lord by this decision that I make? It's a warring life. But number three this morning, the rule of the Holy Spirit over us in chapter number five of Ephesians, chapter verse number 18. It says, and be not drunk with wine, we're in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible mean when it says filled with the Holy Spirit? I guess it would be helpful to know what it does not mean. Being filled with the Spirit does not, is not some dramatic experience just to make us happy. Or some kind of zap from heaven that makes us act in strange ways. So how can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? I see, first of all, complete control of our lives. Complete control of our lives. There were three senses in which this word was used in Paul's day. The word was used to help us to understand what it meant to be filled with the Spirit. The first word is often used to speak of the wind filling the sails of a ship. A sail ship. That would have the sails set high upon the mast. And when the wind would come, it would hit that, those sails. And it would push and guide and direct the ship to go in a certain direction. Those sheets, those sails were, were filled with wind, becoming energy to, to move that ship. And I'm reminded of 2 Peter chapter 1, and holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. A second word was permeation, uh, such as the use of salt 
to permeate meat in order to flavor or preserve it. Being filled with the Spirit means that our life is so permeated by the Holy Spirit of God that everything about us, how we act, how we think, what we do, will bear the divine image of God. You're looking at me like I just said a bad word or something like that. The Holy Spirit of God permeates our life and guides and direct us in how we think, how we feel, and, how, and what we do. But also takes control. It takes control of us. Now I have in my house, I have a baseball glove. And you realize if I put that baseball glove on the table, you realize what it's going to do? It's just going to sit there on that table. Eventually, Lisa's going to say, can you get the glove off the table? That's one of my imperfections, leaving the glove on the table. And I'll say, sure, and I'll take it, and I'll move it to the garage, and hopefully softball season will come, and I can pick it up and, and bring it out to the ball field over there and, and use it. But you realize that a glove on that table is just a glove. It cannot do anything, can it? Until I take my hand, this one here, and put it into the glove, my hand fills that glove, and now the glove will do whatever I want it to do. I wish when I was playing softball and the ball was, or baseball, the ball was hit to me, I'd be able to react fast enough to grab it, but usually I, I can't get down that low to get it, and it just keeps on going that way. But that's not the glove's fault. That's my back's fault. That's my belly's fault. That's all those faults. But you take that glove and all of a sudden you can control what it does. And that's what that third word talks about of taking control. The Holy Spirit takes control of our lives. And he guides us. And he complete control. But lastly, it's a continual control. He continually controls our life. The tense of the phrase, be filled, simply means that Paul is saying, continue to be filled. You know why? Because there are things going to happen in your life as you are filled with the Spirit of God. That you may quench the Spirit of God, and pretty soon the Spirit of God is not having control and rule in your life. We have to continually be filled with the Spirit of God. There's one indwelling of the Spirit of God at salvation. There's many fillings because we do quench the Holy Spirit of God. We do kind of control Him in certain areas of our lives where we don't want Him in. <clears throat> we have to be continually controlled. Now, i got a few minutes, and I, I might meddle just a little bit. Do you realize that the Internet is good and it's bad? It has a lot of good things for us, but it has a lot of evil things for us. Pornography is, is rampant in our society. There are individuals falling uh, continually to pornography weekly, almost daily, because they can't control themselves. And I'm not talking about the unsaved, folks. I'm talking about the saved. I'm talking about, I'm talking about pastors, missionaries, evangelists, that when they're tempted, they're not controlled, they fall into temptation. The internet has some good things. It has some bad things. Now, I don't go on Facebook very much. But one time, sometimes when you do, what I'll see is, is, is people taking their opinions and their preferences and they put it out on Facebook, on their page, and all of a sudden what you see is, is, is uh, comments underneath these, these posts that really ought not to be in a public social domain. 
It ought to be dealt with individually, separately, outside of every friend that you have and every friend that your friend has where they see all these different things because it's just the thing to do. That's what Facebook is for. I think Christians today, I'm not talking about Grace Baptist Church in general. I'm talking about Christians in general. Christians who know Jesus Christ. Those who have that relationship. What they do is they go out there and they spread all their dirty laundry about how they feel about things and about how other people disagree. And you know what? It, it's very discouraging to see that on Facebook, on social media. And I think that if we were controlled, continually controlled and guided by the Holy Spirit of God, you know what's going to happen? We're going to start, we're going to stop some of that. I don't know how many times I see a post and I thought, oh boy. And all of a sudden, delete. <laughs> you want to you put it out there for everyone to hear. You know what you want to do? You want to get that like button. Like, 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 like. You want to get that little heart? Love, love, love. And you try to see who gets the most likes. Who gets the most loves? Do they have a dislike button on there? They ought to, <laughs> if they don't. And folks, the harmony and the unity of the church gets divided because we're not controlled. We're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not controlled continually. And I must say, there's times when things happen. Just when I was going down to South Carolina, I was driving, and this car came from the HOV lane. I'm still not sure what that means, but they came over into the lane where I was at, and three cars slammed on their brakes. And this car here was coming over outside these cones and hitting the cones coming into our lane. I hit my brakes. And I looked in behind me in the rearview mirror, and I saw a lady driving behind me who was probably about 15 feet from me. All I saw was the white head over the, the, the wheel like this. And praise the Lord, she hit her brakes and avoided rear-ending me from me rear-ending someone else. And I tell you, I was not filled with the Spirit that morning. Angry. You know what happened that day? I quenched the Spirit. I drove on down to I-77, and I'm fuming still. and just, going, oh, just that one person's decision to come over here into my lane could have caused a major catastrophe, major accident, lane shut down. I could have been killed. And I'm driving down this thing, this, just talking to, talking to myself, not to the Lord, about this individual who pulled off into this lane. Hour and a half later, <laughs> I started to breathe a little bit better. I started to realize and say, you know what, Lord, that was wrong. I was angry. Did I have a right to be angry? I believe I did. But it shouldn't have been another hour and a half down the road until I got over it. You know why? Because I wasn't controlled. Folks, our church today, in 2021, we ought to be individuals who are controlled by the Spirit of God. Continually controlled. And when we quench the Holy Spirit of God in our lives and, and, and realize that we're not filled, you know what we do? We confess it. We confess whatever quenches the Holy Spirit of God. You ask for forgiveness. You get right with God. Sometimes there's times where I have to get right with God many times a day. And if we're going to be spirit-filled, if we're going to have a, a, a blessed and successful 2021, I believe that we need to be spirit-filled individuals. 
submitting to whatever the Lord has for our lives. No matter where he leads us or where he leads our families or whatever he does, we need to be controlled and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Can I ask you a question this morning? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Are you filled today? Was there something that happened maybe on the way to church today that, that caused you to lose your filling of the Holy Spirit? How full are you today? Can you push yourself away from the pew today and say, boy, I'm full. Not physically, but spiritually. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, that we do have the third person of the Trinity living inside of us today, dwelling inside of us, guiding us, leading us, reproving us. And I believe that's a part, Lord, where most of us fail is letting the Holy Spirit reprove us and show us of our, of our shortcomings, of our, of our wrongs. And Father, this morning, there may be some here that have entered into the doors of Grace Baptist Church that have never been indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God because they never entered into that relationship with you. They've never accepted Christ, you, as their Lord and Savior, and they're depending on other things, their, their works, their, their good deeds, their baptism into the church membership or because they're on a, a role of a church. Father, we do know that you indwell us at the time of our salvation, and there may be some here who are not dwelt and dwelt. So, Father, I pray that you would use this time as we have an invitation, Lord, to work in their hearts and to guide their hearts and to understand, help them to understand that if they were to die today, that it's possible that they may not enter into heaven. I'm thankful that the Bible tells us that we can know for sure. It's not a I hope so or I think so. It's a no for sure. So, Father, I pray that during this time of invitation that you would work in our midst. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would and have your eyes closed and your head bowed and amber begin to play. If you're here this morning and say, well, Pastor, I want to start 2021 and I want to be filled with the Spirit of God. I want to live a life that is pleasing and worthy and a life that shows glory and honor to my Savior. If that's you this morning, simply raise up your hand and put it back down. I'll pray for you. Is there anyone like that this morning? I want to live my life pleasing to the Lord. Amen. Many, many hands. Amen. How many would say today, Pastor, I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of me today. How many would say, Pastor, I'm saved this morning. If you're saved this morning, you're simply raising your hand, put it back down. Are you saved this morning? Do you have that relationship? Do you know that no soul relationship? Amen. How many would say, well, Pastor, I'm not sure. I think so, but I don't know for sure. Is there anyone like that who would say, Pastor, pray for me. I don't think that I'm saved. I, I don't know for sure. If you're Pastor, I'd like you to pray for me. Is there anyone like that this morning? Somebody raise up your hand, put it back down. Anyone like that this morning? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day that you've given to us. And Father, the opportunity we have to worship you and honor you. And Lord, I pray that our worship of our hearts to you was, was genuine this morning. Uh, Lord, that uh, you were pleased with our, our heart attitude and our spirit this morning. And Father, it's our goal today to live a life that would honor you, not just for a week or a month, but Lord, forever. And I pray these all things in Jesus' name. Amen.